My name is Jack Siegel. You'll note that I do not have a middle name. I have two brothers. Both of them have middle names, but for some reason or another, my mother never gave me a middle name. I was born in Brooklyn, New York. It was a very warm place to live. It was a happy place, a joyous place, and, and especially friendly. It was different. It wasn't like today. Absolutely 100% different. No two ways about it. It was really an enjoyable place to grow up. I knew everybody on my block, and our block was not a lot of houses that you have uh, now just interspaced with gardens, you know, along the side. Each house was attached to the next one, and each house had three stories. We lived on the ground floor, first floor, you call it now, then there was a second floor and a third floor. There were no elevators, but, uh, and it was a long block. It was a very long block. I knew everybody on the block. And they were my friends. They were really my friends. House was a very warm house. It was a lot of Jewish food in it. My mother was always uh, cooking. Oh, I loved her gefilte fish. That was number one. I loved what she calls halibsis. Halibsis is a stuffed cabbage, which is uh, a cabbage on the outside, cabbage leaf on the outside, and chopped meat on the inside. I loved that. I loved also when she'd make Chicken, chicken soup with uh, matzo balls on the inside. I love that. My mother was a very good cook. She always was a very good cook. It's lucky we didn't get big bellies, you know, at home. Henry was my father's name, and Bertha, but nobody called her Bertha. We all called her, every, all our friends called her Birdie. That was her name for sure. My parents were very warm people. They were very compassionate individuals. They were interested in people. They always liked to help, to aid, to assist people, to do what they can to help people. They felt that they, they were fortunate because of God, and therefore they wanted to help other individuals also. My father had a business. He manufactured men's sportswear especially vests, and he did very well for himself. He was an easygoing person who was a very loving individual. Let me tell you something about my dad when he was a worker. When my dad was a worker. He worked for this company as a cutter. What they do is they put out all the material, and then what they do is they cut the material in order to have the sewers sew up the material into uh, jackets, pants or whatever it uh, may be. So one day, one of the men, I still remember his name, and so many years ago, Jack Sheen, his name was, and he said, Henry, everybody's talking about you here. And he said, I hope it's good words that they're saying here. He says, they're saying, you never go out with us at night. We all go out, we stop work at five, and what do we do? We all go for a beer. You never, never, never went for a beer with us over here. Is it because you don't like us? He said, no, I got a night school. This is where I got a night school. I have to graduate and get a high school diploma. This is what I have to uh, do. And uh, they looked at him and this fellow Jack Sheen said, well, that sounds kind of strange. He says, come over with me to the window. The place where they worked was on the sixth floor. He says, what are you gonna do? shoved me out of the window. He said, no, I'm not going to do that. He said, I want you to look down over here. He said, what do you see down there? He says, I see a horse and wagon. He says, yeah, he's pulling a, a wagon load of uh, milk. He says, that horse, that horse, that's what he has done since the day he was a young horse. And he's going to do that until the day he dies. Now you told me over here, or I told you, I told you that I have to get a high school diploma. 
because if you want to get any place in the United States, you have to be educated. Educated starts with getting a high school diploma. And he looked at my father and he says, well, what does this horse have to do over here? He says, it doesn't make any difference where you're born, it's your education. That horse was born in the United States, but he ain't going any place because he does not have a high school diploma. I'm going to get a high school diploma. And he did. And the outcome was eventually my father opened his place of business. The man who was the top man under my father who took care of the other workers there was Jack Sheen. <laughs> my father was originally from a town called Sterwitz. Sterwitz was a little a small town in Austria-Hungary. That's where he was uh, born. And when he was a young man, First World War came about. Austria-Hungary was in the war, joined by Germany against the Allies. And um, he was in the artillery. He was in the artillery for approximately three years, 1915 to 1918. And uh, that's where he was. In fact, he was even wounded. He had a little piece of shrapnel that hit him in the head. Luckily, it didn't have too much force to it and didn't go too far into it. My father came to the United States in 1922. He had two wealthy uncles living in Rochester, New York. And they said, Henry, what are you going to do in Europe? You were there until 1918, living in Austria-Hungary in this little hick town. And then he moved to the big town, Vienna, Austria, when Austria was separated from Hungary. And they said, uh, come to uh, the United States. They couldn't get out of it soon enough. This is what he said. There was a lot of uh, anti-Semitism there. He was in the army. He was wounded. The golden land was USA, United States of America. My father brought over his father, his mother, brothers, sister. He had one brother who was not married, who was a patriot for Austria. He remained there killed in the Holocaust. He had also a sister who married somebody from Romania and they stayed in Europe and they had three children. They did not come to the United States. My father wanted to bring them over also, but they did not want to come. Killed in the Holocaust also.
it had a traumatic effect, especially on my uh, father, because he had blood relatives, his brothers, sisters, brother and sister who had been killed. Why did he go to Brooklyn? Because they told him his two uncles told him, Henry, you'll never get married to a Jewish girl in Rochester. We don't have too many Jewish girls in Rochester. Brooklyn, overloaded with Jewish girls. You'll find a surplus over here. Which he did, and he met my mother. My mother was from New York City, the east side part of uh, New York City. I don't know if she was born in Manhattan or in Brooklyn, but it's only across a bridge, that's all it is. My mother took care of the home, but she did everything. Not only did she take care of the home, after that, uh, in the morning, probably 10 o'clock in the morning, she went into my dad's business, which was across the street from our home. And she worked there on the machines, sewing machines, amongst all the other people who did sewing there. And then she would go to the yeshiva, which is a religious school down the block, about a block away. And she had a group of women that prepared lunches, free lunches for all the children over there, 250 students there. She was a hustler. There was no two ways about that. And nothing was difficult for her, nothing was tough for her. She could do it. Just tell her about it, and it was achieved and accomplished. Oh, my mother was very warm hearted, but she was a tough individual. She was the one who ran the house. Besides working with my dad, besides getting the dinners, the lunches, for the kids in the school. She could work not 24 hours a day, she worked every day 28 hours a day. And she loved it, she said it was a short day. It was a very short day. Nothing was too tough for her. She could do anything, anytime, any place. And she had loads of love in her heart. But if we did something wrong at home, the disciplinarian in our home was my mother. In fact, I'll never forget my mother uh, once told my father, my father came back, she sees my father is, is crying. He says, what happened, Henry? And uh, my father said, I slapped Yankee. They called me Yankee. My Yiddish name was Yankel, so they called me Yankee. And he says, I slapped him. I don't know what I did. He said, uh, get out of here. I'll take care of him over here, what has to be done. And uh, she would give me a bawling out. My father was the one, uh, my father was the one who could be very compassionate, very warm hearted. My mother was also, but he could not do anything to any of the kids when they had to discipline somebody. Bertie, this was done improperly. Go take a walk around the block and come back. When you come back, you'll see everything is perfect. You know, it's a strange thing. My earliest memory, by coincidence, I was telling Toby, 
my earliest memory is sitting in the window with my mother holding me, and she was looking out the window, and it was Yom Kippur night, I'll never forget that. And uh, we were looking outside, and it was raining outside, and my mother was holding me and kissing me and stroking my face. Very compassionate, real compassionate. Every year, my mother used to take us out to Florida. We used to go to, but she took me out of school. I just didn't go to school for a month. The whole month I didn't go to school. And three weeks, my mother was there with me and my older brother. And uh, the fourth week, my father came out to meet us in Florida and we'd come all together back. We'd go by train. And I love to swim. Oh, I love to swim. I love to swim a lot. And I asked my mother once uh, my, uh, my, for something, and she wouldn't give it to me. I wanted a certain toy that was in a store. She said, no, very expensive. I can't give it to you. I said, you'll feel sorry for this over here. And she looked at me and said, loony guy, whatever it was. And I wrote a postcard to my father. I said, dear dad, Mama's met a man at the place where we're staying. And I don't think I want to write any more to you over here. Two days later, my father was in Miami. He came out over there. And my mother said, is that what you wrote to him? She said, I'll beat the hell out of you. I remember she said, she put me and she really smacked my backside over there. I was a lively youngster. I love to play ball. <laughs> this is what I love. Baseball play basketball. I used to go, it was called the Young Israel of Eastern Parkway. And they had a basketball court there. And Lincoln Terrace Park, we used to go to play baseball on Fridays, it was good. But I was also studious, I was a studious youngster. After, oh, maybe the third grade or so, I became a studious individual. I enjoyed studying, I enjoyed reading also. It's interesting to note that um, when I was in the first grade, I just didn't want to go to school. Like, I didn't want to go to kindergarten. And my mother said, you are going to school. But I was adamant also. I was just as adamant as she was. But what happened was, my mother used psychology. She said, I'm going to sit with you in school. And she used to sit with me in school, I think from 9 to 11 or 9 to 12 in the morning. She used to sit in my classroom. She said to me that she learned Hebrew from actually being in my class with all the five and a half year old, six year old uh, kids. I must have been seven years of age. My brother was 10. No, I was probably eight already and he was 11. And uh, it was Friday afternoon. He took me to the stadium movie house. I still remember the picture all quiet on the Western Front, and they were bombarding everything. And I still remember my mother gave me what she gave me for lunch that day. She gave me spaghetti with ketchup and uh, some vegetables on the side. And as we went to the movie, I said to my brother, Mike, I just don't feel good. I really don't feel good. He says, well, let's wait till the end of the picture. It'll be over in a half hour, the bombardment all quiet in the Western Front is going to be going on in probably two minutes. And I said, okay, we'll wait for that. And uh, we sat in what they called in those days the children's section. It was all the way on the side. And you had loads and loads and loads of kids that were sitting there. And as I was sitting there, I said, and it was in the wintertime, I remember, and I was wearing a pupki hat, which is like these... Uh, um, knit caps, you know, knit caps. And I remember that I was sitting, I said, Moshe, I just don't feel good. He says, can you wait to the end of the bombardment? He says, no, I, I told him I can't do that. 
I said, okay, let's go out. We'll go to the uh, bathroom. I said, I really don't feel well. And as I'm going out, I really did not feel well. And I threw up on the heads of all the kids who were sitting in the row just before me over there. And one kid, I'll never forget his word, he says, what a realistic bombardment they have over here. I'll never forget that. And I went into the bathroom. My brother was washing me off and throwing my pupki hat away because that was, I had wiped my hands in it and it smelled from who knows what it smelled like. And a whole group of kids, must have been about 10 kids, came in and said, where's that darn kid who threw up over all of us? And my brother said to him, he was just in here about two minutes ago when he went out into the hall. And uh, this fellow said, let's go find that guy, beat the heck out of this guy over there. And Mosh, my brother said, let me finish washing you off and we'll go home really quickly. I'll never forget that. When I was about, uh, oh, I would say about 10 years of age, 11 years of age at most, uh, they had one of the synagogues, which was about a mile away from our home, was trying to get a choir for the High Holy Days. And they wanted a youth choir. And I remember, I oh, I wanted to be in that uh, choir. I thought I was Caruso, a young Caruso. And I remember what happened was I tried out for the choir, but the cantor, who was from Germany, spoke with a very thick German accent. He didn't like me, and I don't know why. I never did anything to him. I never saw him before. I don't know what he didn't like me. And I tried out, and I thought of the... 10 kids of the, no, of the 13 kids who tried out for the choir that I was number one, numero uno. I thought I was the best one of all of them. And when I came home that day, my dad asked me, what happened? I said, I'll tell you what happened. I didn't make it. What happened, I, when we were all sitting around them, the cantor came out of his choir room and all the people were trying out, all the kids, there must have been 20 kids who were trying out for the choir. I said to him, how did I do? He said, Siegel. And he had a strong voice. He said, Siegel, we chose only 12 for the choir. Your number was 13. And that's what he said. That was the end. I didn't sing anymore. And what happened was my father, in order to make me feel good, he would always take us for rides on Sunday. But after the country, any place, he'd take us for a ride, the whole family, my two brothers, myself, my mother, and myself. And what would happen is he would actually say, Yankee, sing the song that you practiced. And he had me sing all the songs, all the Hebrew songs that I learned in the choir while I was studying there. But that Cantor didn't like me, I don't know why. My mother died. She was 97 years of age. My father died when he was uh, approximately 91 years of age. But they enjoyed a good life, a happy life, a joyous life. It's, it's like a chain, and it was another link. And my father was one link, my grandfather one link, I'm one link, and my kids would be another link over here. I didn't have any goals, really. Uh, I went to the yeshiva, the day school all the time, to a religious school. That's how I ended up. I studied sciences. I really wasn't uh, too sure what I wanted to, uh, to be. I just went to that type of school all my life, to a religious school. And the, there's an end point over there where you can go on like you go on to graduate school for a PhD. And then 
when I went to college, I took my first degree at New York University, majored in physics. Then I went to University of Pittsburgh, took a degree in mathematics. Then I took two degrees at Oregon State University. And then I took a, uh, I took a rabbinic degree at Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati and a doctorate here at the University of uh, Houston. I took a doctorate over there in counseling. And my rabbinic degree I took from Sifta Rabbi Chaim Berlin, the same school that I took, went to school as uh, under from first to eighth grade and ninth grade to twelfth grade, had a school that went all the way up to graduate school and I went there for my rabbinic degree. Actually, I applied to medical school at the University of Pittsburgh and I was accepted and I became a rabbi. I was, of course, I had been studying that all my life, actually. A lot of fun, it was a lot of fun to be a young rabbi. And the reason for that was people take to you over here. If I was an old rabbi, I couldn't go over to a stop sign in the middle of the street and extend myself perpendicularly, you know, to the, uh, to the stop sign. Uh, I don't know, I would do things spontaneously. I like them, people liked me and I liked uh, them. And I got invited to many things, functions, homes, and things like that. It taught me that if you don't like people, don't be a rabbi, that's number one. You've gotta like people. And in addition to liking people, you have to want to help people, aid them and assist them. If you can't do those things, you shouldn't be a rabbi because that's what the function, a major, major, major function of a rabbi is. I think my relationship with human beings, not speaking from the pulpit, which is very important, but I think visiting with people, uh, consoling people who have suffered, trying to compose them, trying to aid them, trying to assist them. People still call me now. I'm retired now for so many years already, but they still call me and I try to help them to the best of my ability. Helping people was my greatest accomplishment aiding them and assisting them in their, not only happy occasions in life when they get married and have babies, but even in their, especially in their difficult moments when they lose a member of the family, somebody has to help them because they sort of lost them. I think that was, I've been able to help them. My first synagogue that I, that I was the rabbi was in Homestead, Pennsylvania, which is right outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And Rodi Shalom means pursuer of peace. This is what it means. Second one was Tree of Life Congregation. Didn't have a Hebrew name. I, the Tree of Life could be Eight Chaim. This is what it would be. Nobody ever called it that. They called it Tree of Life in McKeesport, Pennsylvania. And the third one was the Nebate Sadek, the place of righteousness in Portland, Oregon. And my fourth one was here, Beth Shuren Congregation. Beth Shuren means the house of Judaism. I felt for Toby very early in meeting her. In fact, we weren't even going with each other too long. We went for each, with each other for a short period of time. I proposed to her. She said yes, and we got married. My name is Toby Siegel. I was born in McKeesport, Pennsylvania. I grew up in Duquesne, Pennsylvania, a small town along the Monongahela River, a town of 18,000. 
I moved to McKeesport when I was 13. It's a town of 40,000. And I lived there till I met my husband and we got married. It was a very small little community. We knew everybody, we knew all our neighbors, and they were all non-Jewish steel workers. We used to go to our neighbors all the time. Uh, my brother would come home from school. My mother never knew when he was coming home from school because he'd stop at Mrs. Dolan's house. She would give him chocolate chip cookies or stop at Mr. Beer's house and he would show him how he fixed watches. And whenever he came home, he came home. And so it was a very, very close neighborhood. And on Friday, we were the only Jewish people in the neighborhood. I was the only Jewish girl in school. My brother was the only Jewish boy in school. And when Friday came, my mother would make a Shabbat dinner, even though we weren't religious people, but we had care packages for our neighbors, like five. We would take in Mrs. Hoff and Mrs. Dolan. We'd just take all these chicken soup, chopped liver, <laughs> kugel, cakes, chicken. And they loved it. They absolutely loved it. My parents are Sylvia Sofer. She was born in Duquesne, Pennsylvania, first generation. My dad is Joseph Chotner. He was born in McKeesport, Pennsylvania, right across the river from each other. And he's also first generation. They met when they were, my dad, my mother was 16. My dad was uh, probably 20. They went together four or five years before they got married. My dad was the quiet, soft-spoken, easygoing. And I always went to him when I had a problem. And every year on my birthday, my dad was a very good writer. And every year on my birthday, he wrote me the most beautiful, beautiful birthday card. Told me every decade what was going to be great in that decade. The, what the 20s were going to bring me, what the 30s were going to bring me. Now I hit 40s, the kids were getting older, I'll enjoy them. The 50s, I'm going to see my grandchildren. He did that until I was 60. He was a very special, caring, loving man. He was one of six children. His father died when he was uh, 16 years of age. And so basically he had to raise his younger siblings. So he had that caring ability about him. My dad worked, uh, he sold uh, men's clothing for a while, or all kind of clothing. Then he went into real estate, didn't do so great in McKeesport because there weren't many things to sell in McKeesport. And then I had two uncles who built shopping malls in the Pittsburgh area, Monroeville, Pittsburgh. And they asked my dad to lease them, which he did. And they grew very quickly. And from there, they asked my dad to move to Aventura, Florida, and lease the big Aventura Mall, which was really something. And my dad and his brother would go every day to my grandmother's house for lunch. And she had no money because she was a widow at the age of 36. And so she had a big bowl on her table. She never asked the kids for money, but she would put all the letters in there from these, her grandchildren. And uh, anyway, my dad would, and the bills. And so they would look when my dad and my uncle go, went there every day for lunch, his older brother, who was two years older, and they would look in that big bowl and they'd say, oh, here's a letter from your sister Eunice who lives in New York or your sister Bertha. And then they would pull out the bill. Oh, here's a water bill. Or you take the water bill. I'll take the electric bill. My grandmother never asked for the money, but she would put the bills inside so that they would pay the bill. She was a very, very wise, special woman. My mother was there for us always. She always had a funny thing she called my Bert, my Toby. We're like we were the only kids in the whole world. Whenever I needed her, whenever I had the children, whenever I had a surgery, whatever, she was there. She was always there. She was the most loving, kind, caring, and giving. She was sending me gifts all the time, all the time. Every time she went shopping, she found something for me and would send it to me. My mother um, was a housewife. And she worked for many years. Actually, she was a housewife. But when I moved to uh, Portland, Oregon, they needed money. It was in the 60s. And she got a job as a, uh, in a dress shop. And she sold dresses for 10 years. And she gave everybody advice there. What looked good on them, what didn't, maybe how they should fix their hair, what they could buy. Uh, even she told one woman she needed electrolysis. <laughs> I couldn't believe she told a woman that. And the woman loved her. She said, we came to my mother for advice. Uh, you take that, that woman who murdered her husband, uh, the one the jury just freed. Why, she wait was... Wait a minute, wait. She was freed by the jury? Well, naturally. They felt sorry for her. She was a widow. <laughs> they used to call her uh, Gracie Allen 
because she would say things and my father would always say, Sylvia, what's in your mind shouldn't be on your tongue because everybody knew about what Sylvia, she would say whatever she felt. Well, naturally, yes. And besides, she had to kill him. She needed his insurance money to bury him. <laughs> and our families were very close. We all lived. I had aunts and uncles in that same city. My dad had uh, his brother lived in McKeesport, and his sister lived two doors down. My grandmother lived a block away, and my dad lived another block away. And on my mother's side, the two brothers and her sister lived within two blocks of one another. And every week we got together. That was what you did for entertainment in those days, because you didn't have money. So you would get together and you would sit and talk. You would go there for coffee and you on Sundays, and that's what you did. On my mother's side, my grandmother's sofa, her name was Lena, and she came from Poland, as did my grandfather. They came from Poland. And um, when my grandfather wanted to take, marry my grandmother and move from Poland to the United States, because he wanted to take her, this was in the early 1900s, and he went to her mother and said, I'm going to marry your daughter and I'm going to take her to the United States. And he smacked, she smacked him across the face. She said, you will not take my daughter from Poland. But he did. Hooray. <laughs> I was so happy because uh, it was a nice life for them. And on my, uh, they were, so they were both from Poland. On my dad's side, I was surprised to learn that his father, believe it or not, was born in the United States. His family came here in the about 1870s, eight. And so his, his, my dad's grandfather was born, or my dad's father was born in the United States about 1890, he was one of several children. But his mother came from like Russia, Austria, that area. And um, she was 15 when she came to the United States. And I said, Grandma, how did you come here? She said she had a sister who was living in the Pittsburgh area. And she heard her parents say that she wanted the other sister, and not she, my grandmother had another sister, and my grandmother Bella, whose name was Bella, to go with her. And I said, didn't you say you didn't want to go? You were 15 years old. She said, when your parents said do something, you did it. You didn't ask any questions. So she moved to the Pittsburgh area at 15, got a job in a cigar factory where she met my grandfather who also worked in the cigar factory. And they were married one year later and had seven children. One passed away, Arthur, and the rest were born in the United States. There were two boys and four girls. And on my mother's side, uh, she had two older brothers and a younger sister. I have one brother, his name was Bert Chotner, and I don't remember ever having a fight with him, ever. He was a fabulous brother. We were extremely close. My brother lived uh, in Chicago most of his life. That's where he was married. and. Uh, I always took care of my brother, loved him. I was like the big sister. That was my best thing I could do was take care of Bert. We went everywhere. On Sunday, we spent the whole day together. We went to Hebrew school. At eight. We used to leave at nine o'clock in the morning, take a bus to go to Sunday school. Sunday school was over 12. We would go for lunch downtown. And then from lunch, we'd either go to a movie or we would go roller skating and we would get home at six by bus. My parents had a great day by themselves because they would give us 50 cents and we, they, we were gone for the whole day. In fact, I told my grandson the other day, he was with my granddaughter, there's two years difference, Lexus and Brandon, Scott's kids. And I said, and my niece was visiting in town because her daughter was in a soccer tournament and it was her father who was my brother. So I said to the kids, her father was my brother, and we never really fought. We played games, Parcheesi, Monopoly, we played pickup sticks, we played jacks, we played outside, jump rope, hopscotch. We never really fought. You two don't fight. And Brandon said, oh, yes, we do. <laughs> I said, you don't like my brother? And I, we didn't fight that much. I don't know why, but we just never did. I have happy memories. Our birthdays were, were a big thing. For my birthday, every year, my parents had my entire family over at our house. We took pictures with a movie camera. We were always together as a family. It was happy. I mean, we didn't do big things, 
We didn't take big vacations or anything, but they were fun things that we did. Just getting together all the time. He also did things in the mall. He ran trains in the mall for my parents. He did that in the Pittsburgh Mall and he did that in the Florida Mall. And he uh, also was a hospital administrator for many years until he gave that up and just basically ran the trains in those malls. And um, he passed away from colon cancer. It was so tiny when I look back, it was probably 700 square feet. If you opened the front door, you saw the one bathroom on top of the stairs, so you had to make sure if anybody was coming to the house that the door to the bathroom would be closed. I slept with my brother, because we only had two bedrooms. I slept with my brother till I was 13, and my parents felt that that was time that I needed my own bedroom. And so uh, we, we, we were partners in our bedroom for till he, until I was 13. We played games. We used to play birdie from the top of our beds and fly under our mattresses. We listened to the radio every Friday night, five radio shows. Lone Ranger, The Fat Man, The FBI, Mark Chase, Break the Bank, with a bowl of pretzels between our beds. And we just had fun as kids, just fun. I was an easygoing kid. I, I, I wasn't a troubled kid. You know, I didn't like a lot of trouble. I try to please people probably a lot. I had a lot of friends. I always wanted to be in the Christmas. We had two uh, big uh, shows in school. One was a Christmas show and one was a May Day show in May. I always wanted to be in the Christmas show. I love to sing. I wanted to sing. I want to sing Christmas Carol, and they never picked me. But I always got the May Day. And I thought, well, why is that? Because my birthday's in May. That's why they picked me. It never dawned on me that because I was Jewish, they didn't want me in the Christmas in the Christmas uh, pageant, but it, nobody, and uh, my parents uh, didn't want me to have a Christmas tree. Everybody had a Christmas tree, but we didn't because we were Jewish, but they let me hang a sock, a Christmas sock. I was so embarrassed because we wouldn't, they wouldn't let us have a Christmas tree. And every Christmas, people would go from house to house looking at Christmas trees. That's what you did. You had no other entertainment. And I remember Billy Richards came to my house on December 26. He said, can I see your Christmas tree? And I said, oh, Billy, we took it down last night. He said, you took it down on Christmas Day? I said, yeah, we took it down already. I was too embarrassed to tell him. Even though we belonged to the Reformed Temple, my father never drove on Yom Kippur, even though he was Reformed. My mother drove. So my dad and my brother and I would walk, and it was about an hour walk over the hills because it was very hilly in Pennsylvania. And we would talk and we would reminisce and I would ask my dad questions about growing up in childhood. We'd go past the steel mills. And I said, Dad, look at all the fire coming out of the steel mills. And my father would say to me, you should be happy because if those steel mills don't have any fire, people don't have work. And I, we, we just had fun talking with one another, things that I think that is missing today. I went to a small elementary school, um, Emerson Elementary, and I went to a small junior high. And then we moved when I was 13 to McKeesport. I went to the big town of McKeesport, to McKeesport High School, and that's where I graduated. I was average, I would say. You know, I was good as a child, thought it was much better. And as I got older, I got more interested in the social life. I wasn't quite as good. I was a cheerleader in the seventh grade and I loved that. And, uh, but I became more of a student when I met my husband because he was the student. I think I always thought I was gonna be a teacher. I mean, that's what you were programmed as a child. You were either gonna be a nurse as a young girl or you're gonna be a teacher. I was programmed that I thought I'd be a teacher, which I ended up doing. The most, it uh, was my first grade teacher, Miss Wilson. Uh, we had two first grade teachers, Miss Wilson and Miss Smith. Miss Smith was supposed to be the real kind one. Miss Wilson was the stricter one. I wanted Miss Smith. When I went into the classroom, my mother picked the teacher. I said, hi, Miss Smith. She said, no, I'm Miss Wilson. And I was really upset because I really wanted Mrs. Smith. But she ended up being so wonderful to us. And my brother had her also. 
And for years, we would visit her on the weekends whenever we had a chance. We would go to her home just to say hello to Mrs. Wilson. We loved her. I joined the speech club. I loved the speech club. I had a teacher that was probably the best in the state. Her name was Miss Malsey. It's very hard to get into the speech club. And she wanted me to do extemporaneous speaking, and I was scared to death. So the first debate was on a Saturday, and she told me I was going to go and speak just to read up a book on Newsweek or Time Magazine about China, about the UN. And I thought, oh my God, I can't do this. I can't do this. And I called her at night. I said, Miss Malseed, I'm really frightened. I can't do this. She said, you can get out this time, but if you get out one more time, you're out of the speech club. And it was an honor to get into that speech club. So the next time I went, and believe it or not, I placed two first and one second in extemporaneous speaking. I couldn't believe it, you know, and she made a whole thing. She said, now, Toby didn't want to go the first time, but look what happened to her when she finally went. You have to get over your fear. You have to just do it. So I did it. But my dad, I think when I went to college, he left me with this bit of advice. He said, you, you, we try to teach you right from wrong. We try to teach you everything that you knew. Now it's up to you. But I think from what you've learned in growing up in our household that you'll make the right decisions, and hopefully you will. And I thought that was pretty good advice for an 18-year-old. It was pretty philosophical, I thought, when I look back on it now, for an 18-year-old to tell you, you'll make the right decisions. My parents were married over 70 years when they passed. My dad passed away, my mother a year later. Oh, I miss so much about them. I think about them all the time. The biggest mistake I ever made, I was going with somebody before I met my husband for four years, but he, my husband swept me off my feet. Two months later, we were engaged. Two months later, we were married. Nobody knew we were even dating because it was a small town. He was a rabbi. I didn't want anybody to know, not even my boyfriend that I was going with. He called me up the day we got engaged, and he said, I heard you. Is that possible you got engaged? I said, yes, can we talk? And he said, I don't think there's anything to talk about. And I always felt, because I was young, I was 19, that I should have done it a little bit. I should have talked to him beforehand to tell him that I was dating somebody else. He was funny. He was intelligent. He, he already had two degrees, one in math, one in physics, and he had a rabbi's degree. And, but he was so down to earth. He was just, I had pictured rabbis to be different. And when you're growing up, you always say, oh, when I get older, I'm going to marry this. I'm going to marry this. Nobody would have ever expected me to say, you know, when I get older, I think I'm going to marry a rabbi. That would be the furthest thing from my mind. But I met Jack, and he swept me off my feet, and I just didn't care whether I was dating somebody for several years. That was it. I liked her very much. And she was cute. She was pretty. And she was interesting. And I was a rabbi in a small congregation there. And I said, I'm going to pursue this. And I remember buying her a stuffed elephant. I remember stuff. I think two of them I bought you. I bought her two elephants. Later on, after we got married, she told me she does buy stuffed elephants. And uh, uh, I just remember, I just enjoyed being with her also. I got joy in my soul The fact that you're happy What's making me whole Puts a little joy in my soul and I got love in my heart I got love in my heart The promise that no man can tear us apart Puts a lot of love in my heart 
I popped the question. I chose her. And it was a small wedding of about 200, and we decided to have it at Ball Dog Country Club, where I first saw Jack on the, on the diving board. And, uh, and it had to be kosher, because Jack was kosher. But my uncles owned it, and my other uncle was the manager <laughs> of the club. So they made the kitchen kosher. And my uncle, who was the manager, said to me, it's a good thing we like you, Toby, because I wouldn't do this for anybody else. Changed all the kitchen to make sure that it was kosher. And uh, we were married, and it was a whirlwind. I mean, within eight weeks, we were married after we were engaged. Remember about my wedding, it was a very, it was a very lively event. And everybody enjoyed himself and herself. Maybe because I was a nice person and Toby grew up amongst them and she was a nice person also. After our honeymoon in Florida, Miami, we went to Portland, Oregon, and we moved into a small apartment. I had no idea what a rabbinic life was like. I knew no rabbis except my rabbi at the temple, which wasn't even his congregation. And I only saw him on the high holidays. I didn't know a rabbi did anything except speak from the pulpit. I didn't know they were gone every night. So when we moved to Portland, I was in the 50s, and I said, okay, I'm married, so I guess I won't have to go to school. But I didn't know I was married to a perpetual student who already had four to three degrees already. So he said, well, we have a university right across the street, just start at Portland State. It's right across the street, you might as well go. So I said, oh, okay, it was easy going. Nine months, uh, uh, six months later, I got pregnant with Jeff. I said, okay, I'm pregnant, I'll stop. He said, oh, nine months will go so slowly. You might as well just go to college. I said, oh, okay. Jeff was born in the middle of my junior year, and I said, okay, I'll stop now, I'll have a baby, and I'll have to take correspondence course. He said, you're so close to graduation. So I said, okay. So I finished, and by the time we left three and a half years later, I was working on a master's and I had two children, all because he put me through school, and he wanted me to have an education. And I think he did it because he did, I didn't know the rabbis were working every night. He was gone every night of the week and every weekend. But I was so busy having babies going to school grading papers, I didn't even know he was gone. So I think there was a purpose that you did that, huh? Yeah, they say. <laughs> well, I just wanted to be a mother. As soon as I got married, I wanted to be a mother. And it was just something I've, I always wanted to have a lot of children, I mean, a lot of siblings. And my parents only had two. I said, when I get married, I'm going to have very common names for my children, and I'm going to have more than just two children. And so we had four. We had our first child, Jeffrey, there. And when he was two years of age, Michael, uh, Toby was pregnant with Michael. So we had two children in Portland, Oregon and we enjoyed living there in Portland, Oregon. We came back to New York after that. We were there for a while. I got my doctorate, then I, then I got my doctorate. And then we eventually- And we had Lisa in New York, my Lisa. first girl. We the first Lisa. girl in the family, he came from two brothers. Right, then we had Lisa. I was so excited with the it's daughter. I didn't sleep for months. I mean, when the doctor came in, and said, you have a girl, because I said, oh, I can't wait to tell Jack. And he said, he knew our family. And he said, oh, no, no, I have that joy. And I remember you saying to me, what do you do with a girl? Do you have to have a special bathroom in the house for a girl? And she has been Dr. the joy of our life. She is just unbelievable.
Houston was a real, I, Houston gave me an opportunity to be an associate rabbi at Beth Yishun Congregation, which was the largest conservative synagogue in the United States. And I enjoyed that. So I came in, they asked me, would you like to be the associate rabbi of this congregation? I said, you don't toot. <laughs> I would like to. And the committee came out and interviewed me and they accepted me. It was a happy experience. And the reason was because the people were very nice. I remember when I was trying out for the congregation, Toby asked me something about the people. I said, either they can fool you or they're terrific people. They're the nicest people I've ever really met. It was the people themselves, warm, compassionate, understanding, and this is what we liked, and that's how they expressed themselves toward us, and that's the way we expressed ourselves toward them. And I never went with him for an interview. He, it was January, and you said the weather was 80-some degrees. He said, should I tell him? But with the one thing he said, I'm very hesitant about taking, I said, you said the people are great, and it's a big, the biggest of the congregation, and they want you to come. What, why would you be hesitant? He said, well, I'm not used to an organ, you know, because a musical instrument. I said, we have one in the temple where I grew up. It was great. And so he took the congregation. I don't think you were here but a week. And if the organ wasn't playing, he missed it. He brought all the musical instruments in. He brought the band, sort of. With it. He, he did all that. But was something at first that was he wasn't used to, but he adapted to it, and he loved it after that. And the people here were great. And every Friday night at our service, after services, we had like a like a receiving line where you meeted, you greeted all the people. So you'd stand in line and shake hands with all these people. And it was nice. That's how you got to know the people. And people often ask me, well, didn't you get bored going to all these reception bar mystery? I said, no, I like to dance. I like to eat and I like to meet people. And that's your social life. You, that's how you get to know everybody. And it was great. We really enjoyed it. Well, one of the funniest stories was Michael wrote it in his storybook. Well, after we had three children, we decided to wait, and five years later, Scott was born. And so we decided to tell the children after dinner. And I used to always serve oh, yeah. fruit cocktail for dessert, canned fruit cocktail. You have four kids, you don't have time to do a lot of cooking. You just do it as quickly as possible. Open a can, everybody gets a little dish. So I told them, I said, uh, I have a surprise. I have a surprise. When you finish your dinner, I have a surprise to tell you. So they were thinking, oh, thank God, I'm not going to get fruit cocktail again. Maybe I'll get pie, dessert, cake, something. Michael was looking around. He didn't see anything in the kitchen. He said, well, what's the dessert? What's the surprise? I said, well, in a couple months, you're going to have a baby brother or sister. And they said, that's it? <laughs> they thought they were going to get a pie or dessert instead of fruit cocktail. Michael wrote a story, actually, about that. Yeah. I grew up. My name, Toby, was very odd, and I was teased all the time as a kid. I was either a boy, Tobias, a dog's name was Toby, Cigar's name were called Toby's, and I swore as a little kid, I begged my mother to change my name to either Martha or Patty. Those were common names in the early 40s, and she never did, and I swore then that when I have children, I'm going to give them the most common names. I'm not going to give them these odd names. And we had Jeff, Michael, Lisa, and Scott, and they were really odd names. And I remember Lisa once said, I said, don't you? She said, I hate my name. I said, why? It's such a pretty name, Lisa. She said, you say Lisa and 10 people turn around. I hate this common name. But when we had our first child, you remember, I said, Jack said, I said, what name do you like? And he Jane. said, what, what was the name? With a J. Um, not Jason. Not Jason. It was... Uh, Obadiah Uriah. Yeah. I said, this was before the, I told him about the comedy. I said, Obadiah Uriah? I said, that's awful. He said, well, there were two generals in the Bible. I said, I don't care who they were. He said, don't worry, we can call them Obi for short. I said, Obi, but Obi sounds like Toby. They won't know Toby or Obi. I said, let's settle on Jeff. <laughs> Jeff was an easygoing child because I was going to college all the time. And... Of all my children, he was, um, uh, 
I used to put the children, I used to cover with them, put them in, but Jeffrey was always the inquisitive one. I'd try to get his head on my shoulder and he'd perk it back right away. He, did, he always wanted, he was more like Jack. He wanted to study, he wanted Some to- the birds. Yes, he was, he knew all the names of the birds when he was three and four years old, et cetera, et cetera. But um, he was always, and he really wasn't that great of a student until he was in seventh grade. Yeah. And then he just shot off. Right. And then he just, he just soared. He was always, he didn't even, in fact, when he was taking a physics course in college to take his MCAT. He didn't take it, he just did it himself. He read a book, he called him, he said, I have to take physics on the exam, can you give me the name of a book? Because he was a physics major, he has a degree in physics. Yeah. You gave him a book? He gave him a book, he just took it on his couch, studied it, and I think got an A in the course without taking the course. In the Metcats, he did well in physics, but he was always the real studious one. Oh, when Jeff got married, he went with so many girls. And as soon as I told him I liked the girl, that was the end of the relationship. And uh, he was going with somebody we really weren't too happy with, the one girl that he was going with, but they broke up. And I forgot about it. And then one day, yeah. Oh, one day I get a call from this girl from our congregation, Shelly Stolero. She was crying so hard I couldn't understand what she was saying. And she said, you don't know me. I'm, I'm Shelly Stolero. I belong to your synagogue and my father just had a stroke and I, I know your son. I went to high school with him and I met him a couple of weeks ago at a reunion and I know he's a neurosurgeon. I have to talk to him. I have to talk to the neurosurgeon. And Jeffrey always said, do not give my number out, my pager number to anybody. So I was afraid. But she was crying so hard, I felt so sorry for her. I said, well, honey, I'll give you his pager number, but under no circumstances tell him where you got the pager number. And I forgot about it. That was June. Yeah. September, Lisa comes home one day. I'm getting ready for the high holiday. She said, I think your son is in love. I said, which son? And she <laughs> said, Jeff. I said, who's the girl? She said, you know a Shelly Stoller? I said, oh my God, that's the girl I gave the number to. And that's how they met. They went together and now they're married and they have twins, Jordan and Josh. Well, Josh was diagnosed with autism at the age of three. He is really severely autistic. He has very limited speech, but he's such a loving, I, I used to love to go there in the summers when they went on vacation and be there with him because if I'd take him to Ben and Jerry's ice cream, he was so happy. If I'd make dinner, if I'd take him to the park, take him on a swing, I, I miss him terribly. His daughter now is uh, in Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt. She's working at Vanderbilt. In Tennessee, right? yeah, she works at Vanderbilt. She graduated from the University of North Carolina. And she's studying autism with siblings, and I think that's what she wants to do because she's very attached to her brother. She does a myriad of things. She sings off the mic, it goes to these different uh, clubs and can sing. She does dancing like a Cirque du Soleil on a pole. She could do that. And it's, um, but she's a very good loving sister to her brother. They moved there because of uh, Josh. Greensboro. When Jeff was, he was a uh, neurosurgeon in Indiana. He had a big practice there with another neurosurgeon when he was diagnosed. Terror, terror. At three years old. In one month. Was he in terror then? In one month, he said, I've practiced, I've done surgery now for what, 11, 12 years. I've done every kind of surgery. And he said, now I'm gonna devote to find a cause for autism because they had never studied that at Baylor. And he gave up his practice whole turkey. And for one year, he tried to find a cure for autism, which he couldn't. And then he went into another field after a year. He had to make a living. And after that, he, he does different things in the medical field, medical justice, you know. But um, all my kids have given back to, to people, to society. It makes us so proud as parents, it really does. We should have had four more kids. <laughs> now okay we say that. Me. Now we say that. Mike was the active one. Yeah. He was the, uh, in, in high school, the girls all loved Mike. Uh, he was AZA. Very social, very social Mike. Yeah, he was a basketball player. But a good student also. He wanted to be a, a uh, orthopedic. orthopedic surgeon. 
when Jeff would play ball and the coach would say something, he just listened. But when Mike played ball and he didn't like what the Please coach, argue. he would argue. And I'd say, Mike, stop talking. Don't argue with your coach. He was just different than, than Jeff. Jeff And Jeff played, he liked to compete against himself. Michael liked sports like basketball. He liked to compete amongst other people. And Jeff ended up competing. He was in the Ironman Triathlon in Hawaii. He competed on that. And he uh, he rides his bike all the time. He likes to compete against himself. Even though he's in his 60s now, he's always been athletic. remember that we were at home, weren't we, when this happened. We got a call and we were told that Michael was uh, shot. Uh, it was like an explosion, a bomb going off. And uh, I called my neurosurgeon who had operated on me uh, many years ago. And he said he would drive out with us to Austin, Texas that night, which took us over three hours to go out there. And uh, it was very traumatic when they gave us the prognosis of what you could anticipate. First of all, they didn't even know if he would live. The doctor, we were told, who operated on Michael, who was from Austin, did not want to operate because he said he thought he'd be dead. He'd never make it off the uh, table. But he did. But in the morning when he came in at 6 o'clock in the morning, he saw that he was still alive. That's when he decided he was going to operate. And we went up to Austin with uh, <clears throat> our oldest son was in medical school at Baylor at that time. We called him. So he drove up with us and uh, we left Lisa at home and uh, she was 16 or 17 and then Scott was 12. And they just told us we had to hurry up to Austin because they didn't know if he was going to make it through the night. He had walked into a convenience store. It was in the middle of a robbery. He needed $2 worth of gas. The robbers put him in, his girlfriend was waiting for him in the car. The girlfriend he eventually married. It was his high school sweetheart. She stuck by him the whole time in his rehabilitation. <clears throat> and uh, they got married eventually. They have a beautiful daughter who's now married, Sean. But um, they put him in a cooler and they shot him in the back of the head with a 38 caliber. And uh, it was a very traumatic time. And uh, I remember the doctors giving us this dire tale that they didn't even know if he was going to make it. And I, we had to move all his things out of his apartment. My mother and my father came up immediately that night. My brother flew in. His brothers flew in. And I remember saying, we're going to get a storage unit for Michael. And he said, Toby, he said, they don't even know if he's even going to live. I said, I know my son. He's going to live, and we're going to put all his things in storage, and someday we're going to come back, and he's going to take it out when he goes back to school. And just to appease me, because you thought I had really lost it, he said, okay, but he didn't believe it for a minute. But I always had faith that Michael was such a vibrant, smart boy that if anybody could make it, that he could make it. And he did, and he did. But while we were up there, my father said to me, because he was going with Sharon and my father said, you know, honey, it, it's going to be very difficult. She's only 19 years old. He's going to have a long road ahead of him. <clears throat> so you told her, right? And you told her, you said, we understand that, you know, you have a life to live, as my father had told me to tell Sharon. And you told her, and she said, what did she say to you? She said, Mike is my life. And, uh, and I called Dr. Gall. And Dr. Gall was afraid that he wouldn't speak again. And uh, because he, it hurt it near the speech area of the brain. And he said, that's very important. If he, and, and he was going on, it was almost two months before he spoke. 
And so one night, Michael was in bed and he said, Lisa. And we got so excited. That was the first word he said, Lisa. So we called Dr. Gall. He was on vacation in Colorado. He said, he will speak now, but you've got to work every night till midnight if necessary and push him and push him and push him. And Jack would come to the hospital every night after work with cards, spelling over and over because he could count, but he'd get to finally count to 10 and then he'd forget eight, nine, he'd skip it. He didn't know how to spell. He had to learn everything all over again. But he said, but the good thing Dr. Gall told us, it won't take him 20 years. You can do this in two, three years. And so we had people at the synagogue, they helped, they would, they would read for him. And because he couldn't read that fast and they would work with him and we took him to speech therapy, occupation, physical therapy, rolfing. Mm -hmm. You know, we heard rolfing was good, chiropractic. Dr. Gall said, take him wherever, whatever helps him, take him. And we did, we did this for a year and a half until he went back to school. And Jack, when Michael started, after he started to say his first word, he started to prove he was four months in Del Oro here and then a year and a half in therapy. And when he started to get better, Jack would come to the hospital every night after work from nine to 11, he would go over the cards over and over and over again. And we got, then we got a math teacher from high school and she came to try to help him. We got a reading teacher and she came to, starting with books like, uh, uh, what was that name? Jack and Jill. Jack, you know. little baby books. That's the way he started. And to think he went at, back to school, but he was in the plan too, Michael, in Austin. At Texas. And the professors were so great. When he went back, they gave him what everybody would get an hour for the test. They would give him two hours and they helped him. And he wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon. And the professor called us once. He said, with his injury on the right side, he can't move the right side. He said, he will never be a surgeon. And we, he said, it's gonna be like a death for him because it's something he looked forward to. But then he will find another career. And then he took a course in psychology and that was it. He got a master's degree. He graduated the top 12 students in the School of Liberal Arts. Can you imagine? After being what he went through, they had what, how many, 1,600 students in that class in the Some liberal months. arts? And he was in the top 12. And it was just a miracle, really a miracle. And he loves what he does. He has the master's degree, but all our kids work together. And I think that's how Jeff, my oldest one, went into neurosurgery because at that time he went to see Dr. Grossman, who was in medical school. And he told him all about my, well, Mike, he knew Mike. And, um, and he got interested in that. And, but all the kids worked together. They were phenomenal. And they're still close today. It's just really makes, as a parent, it makes us feel really good about that. Yeah. But the kids, I have to say, was the most amazing thing when Mike was hurt, how they all banded together. They stayed at the hospital. Scott was only, uh, Scott was 12 at that time. 12. He slept at the hospital, Lisa slept, they took him, they took him to therapy. It was amazing how young they were, but how they all helped him get better. It was just incredible. And my, and Scott's bar mitzvah was two months later. He never said, mom, why aren't you giving me attention for my bar mitzvah? He just, it was his brother. Everybody pitched in. And Mike and Scott wore Michael's necklace they, they, the police got his necklace the night of the robbery. The robbers didn't even see his little gold necklace. And Scott wore it until he got back into the hospital in Houston. And and he was able to get his necklace back. Scott wore it every night. He wouldn't take it off. The wedding was beautiful. It was at Emmanuel because that's where she grew up. And... Um, and it was a beautiful, our whole family, all my aunts, uncles, your family, everybody was there. It was just a beautiful wedding. And uh, now they're married 30 some years and have this beautiful daughter, Sean, who's married to Edan. He was born in Israel, right? Or in the United States. His father was from Iraq. Was in Los Angeles, I think. And they live in Atlanta now. Sharon was a very loving uh, wife to Michael and she she stuck by him the whole time so for that alone loyal. Uh, for that alone I mean how many girls would stay with somebody at that age who had such a bad injury and her mother was amazing because she loved Mike and I once said to her mother Emily she said I said everybody says how could you 
you know, let your daughter still go with somebody who's so badly injured. And she said, well, I love Mike. What if they would have been married and this would have happened? You just don't stop loving somebody. And for those reasons alone, um, we'll be forever grateful. Oh, she was active. She was not as active as Scott, but if they go in comparison, Jeff was the quiet one, then Mike, he was a little more active. Lisa was much more active than Mike, and Scott just, he, he, was, all over. he was all over the place. That's why we only had four. We, after that, we said no more. <laughs> but Lisa was just, you know, I was so excited to have a daughter. And I remember my brother, when she was born, he sent me all these girls' clothes, and he said, third time is the jackpot. I'll never forget that, so. And I remember I dressed her up every day. She was a, a little baby, and it was hot in New York. Beautiful I dressed, girl. Her, I dressed her in clothes and a bow in her hair, and then my mother came, and she said, oh my God, it's 90 degrees. Why didn't you have her dress like this? I said, because I have a daughter. She said, take those clothes off and put her in a nightshirt and a diaper. She said, she's too hot. But, uh, our kids were our kids were pretty active. Yeah. One funny story about Lisa, she when Jack was a rabbi, we had this huge congregation, and she came in at a service, yeah. and she didn't want him to see her. So we had this huge congregation with an owl going down the middle, yeah. and so she was on her hands and knees crawling creepy. down this whole aisle down to the pulpit. And of course, Jack was up there, and he saw this. And we said, Lisa, why did you do that? Because he could see this little backside going up and up and up and down. You know, she was like three years old, four years old. He said, she said, I didn't want anybody to see me. And she crawled all the way down to the very end so that he wouldn't see her. Lisa called me and said, there's such a handsome guy in my dorm. I said, oh, well, maybe he'll ask you out. No, we're just friends. We're just friends. We're just friends. We're just friends. And but she kept mentioning his name, Matt, 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 Matt but never went out with them. So one day we were in Austin and we were driving and we stopped the car and this handsome man, young man walks across the street and Lisa's getting out and he stops, he says, hi, Lisa. I said, Lisa, who's that? She said, that's Matt. I said, I like the way he looked at you. It wasn't just hi, Lisa, it was a pause and hi, Lisa. So then Lisa said, I need to ask somebody to my sorority. I said, what about that handsome man, that handsome young man? So she asked him out, and that was it. She went with him ever since. But I saw him first, right? I saw him first. <laughs> Her wedding, we didn't know who to invite. We had a congregation of over 2,000 families. Who do you invite for that? So we decided to invite the entire congregation. Right. And I thought, oh my God. So we had over 900 people at mm -hmm. her wedding. And we couldn't afford a big wedding, but so we had, afterwards we had somebody, yeah. uh, we didn't have dinner at the, at the wedding. We just had cookies and cakes and some cheese and some champagne. But then we thought, that's not fair to Lisa to have just 900 people. She wants to dance with her father at the first dance. So we went afterwards to the Omni Hotel for 175 people, all our family and our close friends. And it was, it was a fabulous day. It was really a beautiful wedding. Everybody was so happy in our congregation to be invited because that had never happened before where they invite the entire congregation. I'd said if I had to have one son-in-law, this is the son-in-law for us. Matt. How would you describe him? Same thing. He's kind, he's caring, he's loving. He comes from a closely knit family and he welcomes us. When we had the flood, the hurricane, I stayed with them for six months. He was gracious, wonderful. We come to their house every week for brunch. Sunday, right. Friday night for dinner. Right. He's, he's, he's fabulous. He's, I just love him. They have three beautiful children. Two of them live in California, Allie and one Nicole. One lives in New York. And one lives in New York. And growing up, we babysat all the time for them. They played in our house. They came to our house Friday night dinners. They had plays. We took them on trips. We went to Galveston. We went to Florida with them. We yeah. took, we did so much with our children growing up. And so we have a close relationship with them. Nicole is the most caring, the kindest. Compassionate. Yeah. 
love that. She's beautiful without, she, she's so beautiful, but she's not vain. She's just, she's perfect job. I think she's a perfect job. Zach. Zach is my go-to guy. He's so loving for a young man. He is just the most loving young man. I just, when he comes home, he just lights up our lives. I call, in fact, I called him last night and he, I told him I was gonna he see him. He calls us pretty regularly also. He's very family oriented. And Allie is a young lady now. She lives in California, but growing up, we had so much fun together. She'd put on shows for us. She would do everything. She's really so, talented in the field of fashion and she's just really beautiful and talented and uh, we're very lucky we have beautiful grandchildren and kind grandchildren. Here. Scott was born in Houston, Texas. He was here. Dr. He was Klein was his doctor, you remember? Right, Perry Klein. Uh, Perry Klein. <laughs> Lively, let me put it this way. Energetic, let me put it this way, energetic. He, he, he used to climb out of his crib at a year old. Yeah. And one day we couldn't find him. We couldn't find him and we looked all over in the neighborhood. And then we decided to look in all the swimming pools and we couldn't find him in the swimming pool. And then somebody, a policeman came by holding a kid <laughs> in his diapers. And he said, do you know this kid? <laughs> I wanted to kill him. I agree. I'm so happy to see him. He was, we didn't know about hyperactivity in those days, but he was really he used hyper. to climb out of his crib all the time. Climb out of his crib. He he was into everything. He just was. He, he opened the door and he walked out. He had just walked out. It was almost a mile away from. He wasn't even home. two years old. He crossed no. the street, walked to the railroad yard, and a, a trucker saw him yeah. in a diaper. He couldn't talk. He turned them over to, to the, the police, police station. station. It was a little police station right next to the synagogue. And he was the one, somebody said, Call the police I'm looking for his kids right Yeah, he now. said, Maybe he said, did your child have a diaper on? <laughs> he was interested in the gum machine when he went. Yeah. But he was active in the synagogue. He once broke the door in the synagogue, remember? Oh, yeah. But the funniest thing is when Scott, because he was so active that he wouldn't sit still in school and it wasn't until high school even in high school he was so active he was on the football team in high school and when he called in college after his first semester he said he made a 4.0 we almost fainted we almost yeah, dropped the scott, yeah. we couldn't believe it the kid because jack would study with him and say scott 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 he didn't have to study with the first two he studied more with lisa and with scott sit down sit down sit down we got to do the spelling we got to do the spelling over and over and over again and then when Scott walked to get his degree in medicine in Galveston, yeah. we looked at each other and we said, Let's go down the front and run, make sure it's in. We said, in our wildest dreams, did you ever think this kid would be a doctor? Look at him today. I mean, because he was so active, we never, and my mother called once, she said, I know why he's active, he's eating cocoa puffs. I said, Mom, he's eating cocoa puffs, he's active because you're active. His mother's active, Jack's active, that's why he's active. Scott married Dina. Now, how did he marry Dina? Her parents lived in Austin, Texas. And by coincidence, <clears throat> they had some friends who belonged to Beth Shore and were having a bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah or something like that. And they came and I saw this girl, very pretty girl. And I told Toby, I think, did I tell you? I said, she's a very pretty girl. Let's get her a dress. He could take her out. And uh, her father gave me her address and I gave it to Scott. But six weeks later, I asked him, how was this girl, you know, from Austin? He said, I lost her address. I said, I'll get it for you again over here. To Lisa. What's that? You told Lisa to call. Did you call Lisa? Lisa called. And if you finish the story, you know that she knows the details. I know the general. Women know details more than men. Gave the number to Lisa. And Scott didn't do it, so Lisa pursued it again. And she said, here, she's a pretty girl. I saw her, take her out. And so he did. He drove to Austin and took her out. But years earlier, when Jack used to go up to University of Texas for the college homecoming, he would have a dinner with all the college kids from Betty Shuren. 
and her parents lived in Austin and she would arrange the restaurant. It was a little, coincidence. Yeah. Little did we know that 20 years later, our kids would be going together, but he knew them years before. Yes. And they went together not too long, and they, but Lisa's the one that pushed Scott to do it. He didn't want to do it. Well, Alexis and Brandon, yeah, two kids. they're adorable. They're, they're smart, yeah. they're funny. And they remind me a lot of the way I treated my brother. Alexis sort of is the mother to, to Brandon, and they get along, they put on plays together the way my brother and I used they're to. They're young, what was it, 10 and eight? 10 and eight, and uh, they give us a lot of joy. And there are young ones, because everybody else is older. So it's like having a second family all over again, keeping us young. <laughs> no, but growing up, everybody said, what? none of your children became rabbis, aren't you? You're disappointed they didn't become rabbis. And you always used to say, that's Yourself. my fingerprints. Right. You have your fingerprints. Right. You have to put your, you have to put your own. Your life. I put it on mine, you put it right. on yours. And he encouraged every one of them. But with medicine, with the boys, yeah. you work. You. I used to work with them and teach them the science and things like that. Help them. I mean, didn't teach them, but I mean, I would help them and aid them. And assist with Jeff, them. he bought the brain. Oh, and yeah. The brain. Is, we, I got a, a uh, the human brain, it was called. And we actually put it together with glue. We put together a human brain by coincidence. He became a neurosurgeon. And with Scotty, it was very interesting. With Scotty, I, we, I bought for him, I was able to get for him the human eye. And he became an ophthalmologist. And with uh, Michael, I was building with him the human body and putting together all the bones over there. He wanted there. to be an orthopedic he surgeon. He wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon, but he was shot, you know. And Lisa it. just surprised all of us. I mean, she went into yeah. real estate. Someone... I wanted, I told the suggestion to be a gym teacher. Yeah, because she was so athletic on the yeah, bars. Yeah, she was very athletic, very good. And, and she just, she went into it and she just loved it from the moment she went into it. She, it was a natural thing with yeah. her, just a natural She was always thing. a pretty girl. And she was with uh, Shelly once, because she was selling uh, Shelly's mom's home when she moved to Greensboro. And Shelly said she was on listening to her on the phone with this man. She said, I couldn't believe it. She said, I would have hung up on this man. And Lisa just calmed him. She said, I sat there and I thought, oh my God, how does she take it? <laughs> We were very easy. We were not very strict, but we were very loving. That's one thing we were to all the kids. And uh, they paid us back in return. They were good to us also. He was the easy one. If I had to punish the kids, I was the one. But he never disagreed with me, but I would get him in the kitchen and he'd say, oh, you're so tough on them. Don't lie a week that they can't do something. Leave the kitchen. It's my day. because he was soft. He could and when, if he would have a fight with the kids or get angry, he'd put a sign on their door. Daddy loves you. And I would why are you putting a sign? You just you just argued with him. You just disciplined them. Why, why are you putting a sign up on the door? Daddy loves you. They know you love him. That was my nature. And I was the disciplinary because I learned that from my dad. My dad never raised his voice really that I can remember, but he punished, he would say, Honey, you can't go out for a week. That was it. I could say, yeah, please, it's five days. He said, honey, a week is seven days. Don't ask me anymore. And that was the end of the story. And so that's the way I sort of discipline with my kids. I, I don't know if they ever remember me yelling. You would maybe yell more, but he didn't do anything. He was a softie. I was just noise. I made the time tell him about dinners every night. Yeah, every night he came in. Family was first with him, even though he was busy all the time. If I called him and I said, I have an issue, he would leave the synagogue immediately. Family always came first. Every night we had dinner, even it was 45 minutes, right? right? But we would sit around the table. Jack, like his father, can't stand gossip, doesn't want to hear anything bad about him. Everybody is wonderful. Everybody is kind. And so when the kids would sit around the table, they'd like to tell little things, you know, so-and-so did this, so -and, -so. and he didn't want any gossip. So I would say, kids, 6.45, he leaves, then you could tell me. Because he said, I don't want to hear it. They're all nice people. I don't want to hear any gossip. I've, I remember Joe Lewis, the boxer. Joe Lewis was an excellent boxer. He knocked everybody out. But then he stayed a little too long. 
and he got knocked out. I figured, like somebody came to me and said, you got, why are you retiring now? You've got good years left in you here. And I said, that's why I'm retiring. I want to retire when I'm still up here, not when I'm on the floor here. And that's when I did it, when I felt that I still had some good years left in me, some active years left in me. He said, if I haven't accomplished it and have done everything I wanted to do, then you haven't done it by 67. I want to write books. I want to travel. I want to be with my kids. I've written six books since then. Well, I'll give you the general thought. They're all short stories except for one. One is actually differences between Judaism and Christianity. But the five books, they're short stories of about five, six, seven pages long. And they're stories. And the stories are always ending with something positive. It doesn't end like so many stories that you read somebody's killed and the other one's killed and the other one's murdered and the other one's going to chop off the head of the mother or father. This one has a good ending all the time. So it is an optimistic series of books is what it is. My favorite title is Focus on the Bagel, Not on the Hope. That I've ever received the best piece of advice love your wife this is one thing if you don't love your wife you're in a very difficult situation there's no two ways about that that's the great if you have a wife that you could love or a husband that you could love and you really have honest love and affection and warmth to those people you've got gold in your bank I think, for example, wanting to do things for the other person, not only thinking of me, myself, and I, but the we and the us, that's the important thing in a successful marriage. It's two people in a marriage trying to unite each other. He always told couples, because he's married so many, what, 1,500 couples, if not more, and he said, always learn to spell the word wedding. The W-E comes before the I. Right. So the we comes before the, and always thinking of the other person. I always want Jack to be happy and be well and happy, and he wants the same, same thing. thing. And that makes a difference, you know, nobody is for himself or herself. Love your kids, be compassionate to them, and uh, do it actively also. Plenty of hugs, plenty of kisses and things like that. Just don't tell me. And each per each child is individual. I mean, they're so different from one another. Our four kids, all different. But each one is so special. And you just have to let them be themselves, be who they are. And they bring you great joy. A family that loves each other, that has good feelings towards each other, that are not jealous of each other. I think our greatest pleasure was going on cruises with our 10 children. Every we year, how many grandchildren. years did we go? About 20. About 20 years we used to go once a year. The whole family would go on a cruise. We'd take all the kids on a cruise. And the adults. We really loved it. We really loved the adults. We really loved it. And watching them interact with one another as adults was, it was just a, great. A close relationship between them. That's our greatest joy. I love them very much. I would want them to remember that I love them very much. Honestly, earnestly, sincerely, and strongly. This is what I want them to always remember about me. Your hopes and dreams for the family. Oh, that they should be successful in their marriages and in their lives. That's what I hope for them. If they accomplish that and they achieve that, they will be successful in life. My family, my wife and children, <clears throat> they're the things that are my, as I said just before, they are the things that are my wealth. They are the things that I really have. And those are the things that I know who will have my back all the time. Other people, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. It depends how they take to you in a certain day of the week. 
with your family, if you have an honest family, a loving family, you're a rich man. You must have been cold air in my shadow To never have sunlight on your face You were content to let me shine You always walked a step behind I was the one with all the glory While you were the one with all the strength A beautiful face without a name A beautiful smile to hide the pain Did you ever know that you're my hero And everything I would like to be I can fly higher than an eagle you are the wind beneath my wings appear to go unnoticed But I've got it all here in my heart I want you to know I know the truth oh, I would be nothing without you Did you ever know I could be I could fly higher than an eagle For you are the wind beneath my wings Do I ever tell you you're my hero You're my everything, everything I wished I could be greatest thing that you can have and achieve is love of family. If you have love and affection within your family, you have achieved the ultimate. This is the most important thing. Mwah.